Hi. Uh, last time we actually started a uh, discussion of um, capillary phenomena. So if you take a glass vessel and fill it with water, you will find that the water surface is somewhat curved near the walls of the glass. I will, I will show this curvature slightly enlarged, but the water surface will be not flat. It will be curved. And this, is, this phenomenon is due to intermolecular interaction. So molecules interact with each other. Molecules of water interact with each other, and molecules of water close to the wall of the vessel to the glass wall of the vessel, interact with this glass wall. So if the interaction between the molecules of water and the molecules of glass is larger than the interaction between the molecules of water inside the water volume, then water will somewhat be attracted to the glass. And that is manifested in such a phenomena of a, a curved surface of liquid near the glass wall. If, uh, to the contrary, you fill this glass with uh, mercury, for example, then you will find a different phenomena. You will ob observe that the curvature has different direction. Uh, in this case, this is also a liquid, mercury, that is mercury and that is water. So in, if mercury is, is poured, poured into a glass vessel, then we will observe that the, the curvature of the mercury surface is somewhat different. It means that the interaction between mercury molecules between themselves is larger than the interaction of mercury molecule with, with the glass wall. So if this is so, then the surface will be uh, curved in a different direction. So this phenomenon is called wetting. When the liquid is wetting the solid wall, or solid, any solid body, that is when the interaction between the molecules of the liquid and the solid body is larger than the interaction of molecules of liquid. And this phenomenon is called non-wetting. So this is wetting. And this is non-wetting. <coughs> if you insert a glass tube here, I will, I will draw a large diameter tube. But actually, we have to take the tube diameter, which is, which is of the same order of magnitude as the radius of curvature of the surface here in the wetting or non-wetting. Then, in, in case of water, there will be a curved surface. And the forces of surface tension will lift water, and water will go up to some height in this small diameter tube. A small diameter tube is called a capillary tube. A capillary tube has such a diameter, which is practically uh, of the same order as the radius of curvature of this curved uh, liquid surface. So. <coughs> So due to the forces of tension, which are directed in this way, uh, the water column will be sucked into this tube, and it will go up to some height, some height h. So water will be here, and uh, this height h actually allows one to measure the surface tension coefficient. I, I told you about this last time, but in a hurry, in the end of the lecture, I, uh, I, put, I, I wrote an incorrect equation. So in order to be correct, we have to notice that the pressure of air is the atmospheric pressure, and here is the same atmospheric pressure. So we choose this point A. This will be point A, or point, well, yes, that will be pressure 1 here at this point. 
And at this point, the pressure is atmospheric pressure. Therefore, <coughs> we can say that the atmospheric pressure, which is on this level, on the level of surface, the atmospheric pressure must somehow include the pressure of this uh, water, uh, of this water column. So the atmospheric pressure, if, if you take this point, which is point one, with pressure P1 inside, inside the water, and you go down into the water deeper and deeper, the pressure must grow with the, deep, with the depth. The, the larger the depth, the larger the pressure in the water. So atmospheric pressure on this level should be equal to pressure in point one here, um, close to the surface, curved surface of liquid, plus the density of the liquid, the acceleration of free fall, and the height of this water column. That is the depth to which we have to go down in order to, uh, to find ourselves on the level of, of the liquid in this, <coughs> in this vessel. So according to this <coughs> equation, we know the atmospheric pressure, and we know actually the difference between atmospheric pressure and the pressure in point P1. Because the difference between pressures near the curved surface uh, was established last time we obtained a formula. We obtained this formula that the difference of atmospheric pressure that is above the surface minus the pressure uh, on the other side of the surface will be equal to 2 sigma divided by r, where sigma is the surface tension coefficient, the surface energy or surface tension, and r is the radius of the tube. So this is the diameter of the tube, which is 2r. <coughs> we obtained this formula last time. And now, looking at these two equations, we understand that this should be rho gh. And in this equation, we know everything. We can measure the density of liquid under consideration, the, uh, ex we know the expansion of free fall measure easily the, uh, uh, the height of this water column. And so we, and we can measure the radius of the tube, because it's not difficult to measure the internal diameter of the tube. And therefore, we know everything in this equation. And we can uh, measure the radius and measure the density, and then measure the h, and then calculate the surface tension coefficient. So this is one of the ways uh, to measure surface tension coefficient. Actually, when people carry out such measurement, they take into account more subtle effects here at the surface. They take into account the angle of wetting, that is the angle at which the water surface meets the vertical uh, wall of the solid tube. And they uh, take into account the cosine of this angle here. And But this will not change drastically the physics of the phenomena. This will slightly change this formula if you take into account uh, small phenomena related to this angle. So, but actually, the idea of measurement is, is this. You measure this, the height of this column, of water column, inside the capillary tube. And then you will be able to calculate the surface tension <coughs> coefficient or the surface energy. Also, in case of mercury or other non-wetting liquids, if you put a capillary tube here, then inside the capillary tube, the situation will be the same. The mercury will not wet, will not be wetting, wetting the uh, walls of the, of the tube. And therefore, <coughs> uh, therefore uh, the surface inside will be this one. And forces acting on, on the liquid at this surface forces directed here will pull the liquid out of this tube so that there will be some distance uh, from the surface of the liquid inside the tube and the surface of the liquid outside the tube. There will be some distance. And uh, that will be some, some depth 
at which the surface in the tube will be lower than the surface of the liquid outside the tube. So the liquid will go down due to this surface tension forces. And again, this uh, depth H measured in the experiment together with the radius of the tube will allow you to measure the surface tension coefficient in this case, uh, <coughs> in case of non-wetting liquid. So actually what we discussed, what, what we started to discuss last time was <coughs> the uh, wetting phenomena. Wetting, some liquids are wetting solid states, other liquids are non-wetting. So if water is wetting the glass, it doesn't mean that water will be wetting any solid state. No, it's not so. There are some solid bodies which will be non-wetted by water. And also if, he, if um, mercury is non-wetting the glass, uh, glass surface of glass, uh, then there, there will be some solid bodied bodies which, which are wetted by, by mercury. Everything, whether the liquid will, will, will be wetting, as in this case, or non-wetting, as in this case, that def depends on the uh, relationship between, between the interaction of molecules of uh, of liquid with each other and interaction of molecules of liquid and the solid body. That's the relationship will define the behavior of the liquid surface. <coughs> also last time we discussed bubbles. We discussed a droplets. We discussed a droplet of water. And we actually we derived this formula that the pressure inside, pressure inside the bubble and pressure outside, pressure outside, well, let it be P1 and that is P2. And we derived this formula that P2 is larger than P1 and uh, P2 minus P1 was equal to 2 sigma divided by radius, the radius of this droplet of water. <coughs> so there are other situation, uh, situations actually when we, we can apply the same formula. Not only in this case when we have a curved surface of liquid and some outside medium like uh, the atmosphere. Not only in this case. Also there are other situations when this formula can be applied. For example, <coughs> for example we can imagine liquid in a vessel and there are small bubbles of gas inside the liquid. Small bubbles of gas. For example, when the liquid is boiling, the bubbles of gas, uh, the bubbles of liquid uh, vapor uh, appear near the bottom of this vessel and they go up, go up to the vessel. And inside each bubble, there is a surface of water and the surface is curved. And so the pressure inside this bubble will also uh, obey this formula. So if pressure inside is 2 P2 and pressure outside is P1, then the same formula will apply uh, because there is a surface of liquid inside this bubble and the surface of liquid is curved and the radius of curvature is known, uh, then, then the difference of pressures inside the bubble and outside the bubble will be given by this formula. Also, there is another situation when this formula can be applied. That is when you produce, for example, uh, soap bubbles, bubbles made of uh, soap solution. In this case, you will have a soap bubble which is empty inside. There is a gas inside and there is a gas or atmosphere outside. And only a thin film of liquid makes this uh, bubble of soap solution. For example, it may be a soap solution as very, which is very common and children play with su such bubbles. But anyway, there will be a pressure inside and I will denote it as usually by P2 and pressure outside, which is usually the atmospheric pressure if this happens in the air. Then the difference of these pressures will will depend on, uh, on the surface energy and the radius, and the radius of this <coughs> bubble. But in this particular case, when 
gas is inside and outside, and only a thin film of liquid is here. We will have two sides of this thin liquid, two surfaces, the inner surface and the outer surface. And as there are two surfaces, then each surface will, will form its own imp impact to increase the inside pressure. And therefore, in this formula, we will have to take into account that there are two surfaces, so the difference of pressures will be uh, twice the value given of the by this formula. That will be 4 sigma divided by the radius of the bubble. We have twice the value given by this formula because here we have two surfaces, two curved surfaces, and each curved surface uh, makes it impact uh, into the pressure, into the inner pressure. Uh, the impact of each surface will be given by this formula. And as there are two surfaces, the final pressure will be twice the magnitude given by this formula. So, so this formula is can be applied to a droplet of liquid when, when the droplet is filled with liquid, or a bubble of gas and so that the liquid is outside. In these cases, we have only one, only a single surface uh, of water, of liquid. And in this case, we have two surfaces. Therefore, we have twice the value, twice the formula will be will have a coefficient 2. So these uh, remarks should be made regarding the material we discussed last time. And now I would like to discuss another important thing, uh, the velocity of liquid flow. The velocity of liquid flow. Assume we have a vessel of liquid and we open a small hole, a small hole here, a small orifice, well, so that the liquid will flow from here. The liquid will flow away. And the velocity, there will be some velocity of liquid flow. Well, is there any way to, to find this velocity? Certainly. Uh, let us imagine a small volume of liquid which has mass mu. So if this small volume, a droplet of liquid, goes out with velocity v, then this volume of liquid will have a kinetic energy given by a well-known formula mu v squared over 2. Where this kin kinetic energy comes from. The energy cannot, be, cannot appear from nothing. If we have some energy, kinetic energy here, then some other bodies in the universe must lose the same amount of kinetic, uh, the same amount of energy, maybe potential, maybe kinetic energy. It's easy to see that if uh, the amount of water mu goes out of the vessel, then the surface level of water should go down in such a way that the mu mass of water or liquid is exactly here in this thin layer of liquid. So if, amount, if the mass mu of liquid goes out, then the surface of liquid must go down inevitably because the liquid is incompressible. The liquid is incompressible. Its volume cannot be changed. Or if you try to compress the liquid, its volume will be changed very by very, very small amount. Liquid is practically incompressible. In the first approximation, it's absolutely in incompressible. So if some volume went out, then uh, the volume inside should, should be diminished by the same amount. And that, that is the uh, small layer of liquid uh, on the surface, because the surface will go down. So this layer of liquid had some potential energy with respect to the position of this mass being mu. And the potential energy will be given by the well-known formula mgh. But m is the mass of this thin layer, which is mu. So the potential energy here, the potential energy will be, uh, well, the potential energy will be the mass of this thin layer 
which disappeared from the vessel GH. And we understand that the potential energy of the liquid inside the vessel became smaller by this amount, and the kinetic energy of liquid going, on, going out w became larger because this liquid had no velocity in this point, and then it has some velocity when it goes out, uh, where it obtains velocity when it flows out of uh, the hole. So this kinetic energy must be equal to the, to the loss of potential energy of the liquid in the vessel. And therefore, we obtain from here that the mass of the liquid going out, its velocity squared over 2, must be equal to the same mass of the liquid, GH, where H is the depth at which this hole appears, at which this hole is located in, in the wall of the of the vessel. <coughs> so from here, we easily obtain by cancelling mass that velocity of outflow of the stream of liquid will be equal to square root 2gh. That formula is the consequence of the law of conservation of energy. And the same law can be applied if a droplet of water is simply dropped from this height and allowed it to fall down under the action of gravity. And so if, the, uh, if a droplet of water or other, any other object is uh, falling from the height h, then the potential energy of this body falling down will be equal to a kinetic energy in the end. So the same formula was in kinematics when we considered the acceleration the m motion uh, under constant acceleration, acceleration a uniformly accelerated m movement of bodies. So the same formula was in kinematics because the same uh, law of physics, the law of conservation of energy can be apl applied here. Well, <coughs> after having considered so many properties of liquid, I would like to solve some problems. And the first problem on this topic will be problem number 341. Uh, 341. Let's consider this problem. A small tube filled with air and open at the bottom is placed into a water-filled open vessel with a screen on the top. So we have a vessel with water. And there is a small tube which is open at the bottom but closed from, uh, from above and open from beneath. Uh, such a small tube is placed into the water. And the tube is filled with air, actually. Uh, anything is filled with air. If we turn this tube upside down, it's bottom up, and allow and immerse it into the water, we will obtain such a situation that water will, will be somewhere inside the tube, and here will be the remaining gas, the atmosphere. The atmospheric, uh, the atmosphere will be here. And so then, the water-filled open vessel with a screen on the top. So there is a screen on the top. There is a screen. Why it, it is there, you will understand soon. <coughs> there is a screen covering the surface of this water. Actually, the screen is needed so that this a glass tube could not go up, could not could not go up uh, from the water, from the surface of the water, and sh should be always inside the water. So we need this screen in order to limit the motion, the possible motion of this glass tube. And uh, the tube cannot be turned over. Uh, how can it be done that it cannot be turned over? For example, the lower part of the tube may, be, may have some load. It, it may be a heavy part of the tube, 
so that the lower part of the tube always uh, al should always look down and the upper part of the tube is light and so it's always up due to uh, Arch Archimedes forces inside the uh, liquid, which we discussed last time. Uh, draw a diagram showing how the depth of submergence of the tube depends on the temperature of the water. So we have the possibility to heat the water and to change its temperature. So the water temperature can be increased, or we can also uh, cool this water vessel, cool down to decrease the temperature. We uh, the problem says that we have the ability to change the temperature of, of liquid here in this vessel. So we have to draw a diagram. Let's draw it. Let's draw, let's show the axis showing how the depths of submergence, where is the depths of submergence? Let us show it here. For example, uh, that will be the depths showing the upper end of the tube. That is the depth. And we have to show how this depth depends on what. Showing how the depth of submergence of the tube depends on the temperature of the tube. So we have to draw a diagram showing this dependence, the depth H versus temperature of water, temperature of water. if the temperature first slowly increases and then gradually decreases. So the initial temperature is, is small, and we slowly increase the temperature in this direction. So what happens here? Uh, there is a gas inside the tube. And as there is a gas, there must be some pressure of this gas. And there must be some volume of this gas. And therefore, the gas uh, also has some temperature. The temperature of external water is obviously will be the temperature of this gas. If temperature changes slowly, then the heat exchange will be will have enough time. The processes of heat, heat exchange will have enough time to equalize temperature of the gas and water at any moment of time. The temperature will be the same. So we have the gas equation, which can describe the gas behavior inside this tube. And the gas equ equation will be this one. Pressure of gas times its volume will be equal to the number of moles universal gas constant temperature. That's the gas equation which can be applied to the atmospheric air inside this uh, glass tube. So let's consider what is known here. For example, yes, temperature is known. It's given. We arrange the temperature regime by ourselves. We can heat this uh, object just as we like. So we define, we determine the temperature we, we determine the temperature uh, ourselves. The universal gas constant is a constant, and the number of moles is constant here because the number of moles, the number of molecules does not change. By the way, this will be a very small number because uh, one mole under normal conditions occupies uh, one mole of, of gas, of including atmosphere, under normal conditions conditions occupies the volume of 22.4 liters, 22.4 liters, that is large volume. And here, obviously, we have much, much smaller volume, hundreds of times, maybe thousands of times smaller. So that will be just a very small portion of one mole, and this quantity is very small. Anyway, we can, we can know it, but this will play no role in solution of the problem. What is the volume? That is the volume occupied by the gas, and what is the pressure? The pressure will be governed by, by the depth uh, of water. Well, let us, uh, let us assume that actual pressure, actual height at which this water surface is inside uh, the tube, H, is 
capital H is approximately equal to small h because the dimension of this tube is small, the small tube. And we can uh, Im immerse this tube deep into the water. So the difference between small h and large h will be just about one centimeter. And if you have this uh, distance, well, about half a meter, then obviously the difference between these two quantities will be about 2%, just about 2%. If this is 50 centimeters and this is 1 centimeter, then the difference will be about 2%. That is, by the order of magnitude, the same. So when, if, uh, when we assess the pressure of water here, we may use the formula <coughs> that pressure is given by a well-known formula, uh, which is uh, a pressure inside water, which is the density of water, acceleration of freefall, and uh, the depth at of, of the point at which we consider uh, the water pressure, the liquid pressure in, inside. So we know something about pressure. Pressure is proportional to the depth. The uh, acceleration of freefall is constant here, certainly. The density of liquid is constant. So pressure is just proportional to the depth at which this uh, glass tube is placed. So <coughs> the volume from this equation will be approximately equal to uh, mu, the number of moles are, if we, if, we, if we use this expression and place it here, and substitute this ex expression for pressure, then we will obtain for volume mu r divided by rho g and uh, temperature divided by h. And also we must take into account uh, the Archimedes force acting on this uh, glass tube the Archimedes force acting upward, the Archimedes force <coughs> acting on this tube F A, the Archimedes force <coughs> is equal, we considered this uh, formula, is equal to the weight of the displaced liquid. The displaced liquid is uh, the, the mass of the liquid or the weight of the liquid which was here, which could could have been here inside uh, the glass tube, but it was displaced by the gas and by the gas and the uh, glass walls. But obviously, the glass walls are thin walls, and they occupy small volume in comparison with the volume of gas. So the main impact to the Archimedes force will be from the gas volume. So the uh, the Archimedes force will be the weight of the displaced liquid, and the weight is the mass of the displaced liquid times acceleration of freefall, and the mass of the displaced liquid is the density of liquid times volume of displaced liquid, and this volume is exactly the volume of our gas and the acceleration of freefall. So that the Archimedes force will be, <coughs> well, proportional to what? If we substitute volume in this formula from the above expression, if we substitute the above expression for volume, what will we what we will found we will find that the density of liquid and the acceleration of freefall will cancel, and we will obtain that the, that that is uh, the number of moles universal gas constant. Uh, rho g is cancelled, and what remains here, t divided by h. So that is the Archimedes force. Well, why the Archimedes force is proportional to temperature? Because the larger the temperature, the larger will be the volume of gas here. The gas will expand if it's heated, because the pressure is constant if the glass tube is kept at the same depth. So the Archimedes force is proportional to temperature because uh, with increased temperature, the volume of gas will be increased, and the amount of 
uh, displaced water will be increased. And why the Archimedes force is inversely proportional to the depth, H? Because the deeper you immerse this uh, glass tube, the smaller uh, will be the volume. The smaller will be the volume is inversely proportional to uh, the depth. The, the larger the H, the smaller the volume. And so if the volume is smaller, then sm the smaller will be the amount of displaced water, and the smaller will be the Archimedes force. That is why the Archimedes force is directly proportional to temperature and inversely proportional to, uh, uh, to the depths. OK, we continue after a short interval.
Okay, so uh, the main thing here is uh, whether this glass tube, glass tube will go down or I it will float up. And this will depend on the relationship between the Archimedes force or Archimedes force and the weight of this glass tube. So the glass tube has its own weight, the force of gravity, which is directed downward, the weight of this glass tube. So the main thing here is the relationship between the Archimedes force and the weight of the tube. If the Archimedes force is larger, then the tube will go up. But if the Archimedes force is smaller than the weight, then the weight is larger and the, the tube will go down. It will immerse to the bottom and, and it will rest at the bottom of this vessel. <coughs> so let's assume that in the very beginning, the glass tube was at the bottom, in the very beginning of our experiment. So we immersed this glass tube down and it, it, was, it, it rested on the bottom. So that in the very beginning, the weight was somewhat larger than the Archimedes force. And we indicated here that the weight in the beginning was larger than the Archimedes force. And the tube was down on the zero level. We will, we will measure the position, well, position here, the position on this graph will be somewhat different from the depth. The position on the graph will be measured from the bottom of the tube. That is H prime. H prime will be measured from the bottom up. Well, it makes no difference. It, it's just convenient to show on the graph. So on, in the beginning, in the beginning of this process, the tube was at the bottom on the zero level when H prime was zero. And originally the weight of the tube was larger than the Archimedes force and the tube was rested here. What will happen then? According to the statement of the problem, the temperature rises. We heat the vessel and increase the temperature. If we increase the temperature of water, then the temperature of gas will be increased, and then under constant pressure, volume will be increased. The volume will be proportional to temperature. And as the volume is increased, the gas volume is proportional to the amount of displaced water, and more and more, more water will be pushed out of the tube, and the volume of the gas will increase, and the Archimedes force will increase with temperature. The higher the temperature, the larger the Archimedes force. And at some point, if Archimedes force was smaller than the weight, then at some point, at some temperature T1, the Archimedes force will become equal to the weight and even a little bit larger at some temperature. At some temperature when the gas volume is large enough and large amount of water is displaced, is pushed out from this tube, then the Archimedes force will become equal and even larger. So at this point, the Archimedes force is equal or even larger than the weight. A, bit a little bit larger than the weight of the tube. So at this point, the force applied to the tube and directed upward will become larger than the weight of the tube directed downward. Therefore, the tube will go up. And as it goes up, the depth H will be smaller and smaller. And as the depth H is smaller, the pressure of the gas will become smaller. But the temperature is the same because it happens quickly. Temperature doesn't change. And e as the pressure becomes smaller, the volume must become larger. The volume of gas, the gas will expand and push out more and more water. And if it pushes out more and more water, then the Archimedes force will, the Archimedes force will increase. As H becomes smaller because the tube goes up, the depth becomes smaller, the Archimedes force will increase because the dependence here is inverse proportional. The smaller the depth, the larger the Archimedes force. So at this point, the Archimedes force, when it became just a little bit larger than the weight, and the tube began to lift up, began to go up, 
the Archimedes force will become larger and larger, and the tube will go up quicker and quicker with some acceleration. And finally, it will hit the screen on the surface of the water and stick to this position close to the screen. So the height h, well, anyway, <laughs> Uh, yes, the height h prime will become larger. That is the distance from the bottom. h prime is the distance from the bottom. Will will become larger very quickly. The t the tube will go up and quicker and quicker, because the Ar Archimedes force will become larger and larger. And so, at this point, the tube will hit the screen and stop. And if you increase the pressure of gear, uh, the temperature of gas, nothing will change. Nothing very interesting will change. Uh, the volume of gas will increase, and the Archimedes force will increase, th but the position of the tube cannot change. So if we start cooling down this vessel, and the temperature will, start will cool down, then at this particular point, nothing interesting will happen, because the pressure of water here is close to atmospheric pressure, that is close to zero, uh, it's much smaller than the pressure of water here in, uh, at the bottom of the vessel. And as the pressure is uh, small, the volume occupied by gas will be large. And as the volume is large, the Archimedes force will be large. So at this point, the Archimedes force will be larger than the weight. And the tube will not go down. It will, be, it will remain stuck to the screen on the surface of the water. And we cool down water and the tube will remain here due to all the formulas written on the blackboard the tube will remain here because the archimedes force at this point is not merely larger than the weight it's much larger than the weight considerably larger considerably larger than the weight of the tube at this point when the tube started its motion the archimedes force was just a little bit larger than the weight. But here, the Archimedes force is considerably larger because the pressure, water pressure here is small. And therefore, if, if pressure is small, the volume will be large. And the Archimedes force will be large. So this uh, relationship tells us that the tube will not sink down, will not dip down, and will not sink uh, into the water at this point, because Archimedes force is still larger than the weight. And in order to, uh, in order to uh, force this uh, glass tube to, to go down, we have to cool down the liquid. And as we cool down the liquid, we cool down the gas here. And as the tem gas temperature decreases, the volume will decrease. The volume will decrease. And the water will go up inside the tube. And as the water goes up, the, uh, the volume decreases. The Archimedes force will also decrease. And sooner or later, the Archimedes force will again become equal to the weight. And at this point, when the Archimedes force is equal to the weight, and then a little bit further, we cool down the liquid. And then the Archimedes force will become smaller than the weight. And then the tube, the glass tube, will begin to sink down. It will go down to the bottom again very quickly. Because as it begins its motion, the depth of immersion increases. And the volume of gas will decrease. And as the volume of gas here decreases, the Archimedes force, the force's buoyancy, will decrease. And the tube will go down quicker and quicker. And so it will go down practically vertically. And at this point, where temperature is T2, the tube will hit the bottom of the vessel and remain here if we cool down the temperature further. So if we increase the temperature and then cool down, and then increase again and then cool down again, the tube will go in this way. First, it, it's at the bottom, and then it goes up, and then it still remains up at the surface, and then it goes down to the bottom. And so the tube will go along this, uh, along this <coughs> curve. Such a graph is called a hysteresis curve. A hysteresis is a phenomenon 
very frequently encountered in different branches of physics. In different problems in physics, we encounter such a thing as a hysteresis curve. People say a hysteresis loop because this is actually a loop which is on the graph. <coughs> okay, let's consider some other problems. Uh, problem number 352. Problem 352. It says a vessel whose bottom has round holes with a diameter with a given diameter d equal to 0.1 millimeter. A vessel whose bottom has round holes of given diameter is filled with water find the maximum height of the water level h at which the water does not flow out. The water does not wet the bottom of the vessel. So we have a vessel of bottom, a vessel filled with water. And there are small holes in the bottom. There are several small holes. Well, at least one hole. One hole is enough. But we may have several uh, holes. And we know the diameter of each hole. The diameter is given. It's 0.1 millimeter, very small diameter, pinhole. That is a pinhole. So actually, the liquid can go out. But in the process of going out, I will, I will show this hole as if it was large. So. Uh, in such a scale that we can see. So this is one tenth of a millimeter. That is a diameter of the hole. And here is a liquid. When liquid wants to flow out, first it bulges out. And if the liquid does not wet the walls or the bottom of the vessel, then this bulging liquid will remain here in this position if the forces of surface tension so forces of surface tension can uh, can resist the weight of the liquid so if uh, if the liquid is non wetting this uh, walls of the bottom this uh, material of which the bottom is made then the non-wetting liquid will just bulge out and remain in this situation. If the pressure inside here in this point, the pressure here will be P2, and the pressure outside will be the atmospheric pressure here, the atmospheric pressure. So the pressure difference will be defined by the radius of curvature of this radius of curvature of this bulging water. And we know that pressure difference is defined by such formula. When this, there is a single surface, not a double, but a single surface, then we have 2 sigma divided by radius. The radius of this, the radius of this <coughs> hole. Actually, what is meant by the radius is the radius of curvature, is the radius of curvature here. but they are of the same order of magnitude. The, radio of the radius of curvature of this uh, um, bulging surface and the radius of this hole mm, are of the same order of magnitude. Actually, very, very close uh, values. So find the maximum height of the water level H. That is, we have to find the maximum height of the water level in the vessel, the maximum height, 
at which the water does not flow out. So if we pour just a small amount of water and the height is small, then the pressure here is small and the forces of surface ten tension here will be quite enough to, to hold the water and to keep it from flowing out. So we have to find the maximum possible depth of water in this problem, the maximum possible H at which the water is not flowing out. So the pressure P2 here at the bottom will depend on the depth of water, on the height of this water column, and it will be given as the density of water, acceleration of free fall, H. And when the H is small, when we have small amount of water, then the pressure here will be small, and the water will not flow out. But if we pour more and more water here, the depth uh, the height of the water will be increased and the pressure will increase and sooner or later the forces of surface tension will be not enough to keep the water uh, here and the water will start flowing out from these holes in the bottom. The water will start flow out. So at this maximum height the pressure of water inside must be equal to this quantity. 2 sigma divided by the radius of this small hole. I don't take into account this pressure P1 outside, uh, Pa, P atmospheric pressure outside, because atmospheric pressure is the same here and here. Also atmospheric pressure here and here is also atmospheric pressure. So these two atmospheric pressures uh, Will, will actually cancel, and we must take into account only the pressure, additional pressure created by the water column of height h. That is why I don't take into account the atmospheric pressure in my final formula to calculate, to solve this problem. So the maximum h from here, from this formula, the maximum h will be given by 2 sigma divided by rho g and the radius of the hole remaining here. The maximum height, rho g, 2 sigma, and radius. So when, when pressure is small, the water will bulge out by a small distance. But as pressure P2 grows, the water will bulge out to a larger and larger droplet here hanging from this surface. And finally, the radius of this, the radius of curvature of this, uh, of this bulged surface will be uh, actually equal to the radius of this, uh, of this hole. So that will approximately, certainly, that is approximately so because we don't take into account the exact value of this angle between the bottom and the surface of uh, the surface of the uh, of water here of water bulging outside we don't take into account this uh, exact value of this angle it will depend actually on many things it will uh, it will even depend on the roughness of this <coughs> uh, surface of the bottom if the surface is smooth the angle will will have one value certain value and if the surface is rough then this angle will will be different and the conditions will be different so there are many small or subtle effects here which are not taken into account so we we can calculate it only by the order of magnitude only by assessing make an assessment what happens in this problem without digging into details but this assessment will be quite uh, acceptable it will be quite good so we have to calculate it and that will be, let's do it, 2 times sigma, and we know what is sigma, we have used this quantity last time in the international system, this is 0 0.0725 joules per meter squared, or newtons per meter, whatever unit you prefer to use, both are the units of the international system, the SI system. Rho. 
that is the density of water in the international system that is 1,000 kilograms per meter cube, per meter cube, one ton of water per meter cube. Then the acceleration of free fall is 10, and radius, radius is half the diameter, and the diameter is 10 to the minus, if it's 0.1 millimeter, and millimeter is 10 to the minus, it's 0.1 millimeter, and one millimeter is 10 to the minus three power of meter, so all this will be 10 to minus four meters. So that is 10 to the power of minus four meters. That is the diameter, and we need the radius. The radius is twice as small as the diameter. So we have to divide this figure by two, and two will go here to the nominator of this formula. So I continue my calculations here. And uh, that will give me what? <coughs> 10 multiplied by 10 to the minus 4. That will be 10 to the minus 3. And multiplied by 10 to the power of 3. So all powers will cancel, and I will obtain just unity in the denominator. So I have only to multiply figures here in the denominator. That will be 4 times this figure, and that will be O. Point four times seven is eighty seven and times twenty five eighty nine meters. So that will be twenty nine centimeters. The maximum height, the maximum amount of water which can be filled into this vessel so that the water doesn't flow out will be about 29 centimeters in this problem. Such is the calculation based on the capillary phenomena on the difference, pressure difference near the curved surface, near the curved uh, surface of liquid. So we have found the maximum amount of water which can be uh, poured into this vessel. And uh, the next problem three hundred and sixty. Next will be three hundred and sixty. It says water rises to height h in a capillary tube lowered vertically into water to a depth L. The lower end of the tube is closed, and the tube is then taken out of the water and opened again. Determine the length of the water column remaining in the tube. So we have a capillary tube lowered vertically into water. So we have a vessel of water and a capillary tube or capillary capillary tube, it's better to say yeah, and the water will rise to the height H. A capillary tube and the water will, height will rise to the height H, and the tube is and the tube is lowered to the distance L, that is the depth L, that is the depth to which the lower end of the capillary tube goes into the water. So this distance L is given. And also we know the height at which the water column will rise in the capillary tube. So these two quantities are given, H and L.
And then the lower end of the tube is closed. So we close this lower end and take this capillary tube out. And then tube is taken out of the water and opened again. So first we close the lower end and take the capillary tube out. That is, so water is here and uh, the, end the, the, the lower end of the capillary tube was closed. So all the water here in the capillary tube was retained in the, in the tube until we opened the lower end. At first, we closed the lower end and took the capillary tube out. And the lower end is still closed. And all the water here is retained. The original length of this letter uh, of this uh, water co column is h plus l. That is the original length, the original height of this water column inside the tube. And then, after we, after we have taken this capillary tube out, we open this lower end, thus allowing some amount of water to flow out, if the water will flow out. It's not the fact, not the fact that the water will want to flow out. Uh, it may not be so, as we have seen here in the previous, in the previous problem, the water does not always flow out the open end, the open uh, hole in the bottom. If the hole is very small, a very small diameter, then the water will not flow out. It will be kept by uh, the forces of surface tension. So sometimes the surface tension here, the surface tension here, or the surface tension arising from the fact that the water surface is uh, the water surface is uh, curved. There is some curvature of water sense and, uh, of water surface, and due to this fact, there is some force, resultant force from the from the surface tension forces, and this force will will support the this water column, and uh, it will not flow down. Sometimes that happens, but not always. If this uh, water column is large enough. And, and the diameter of the hole of the hole is large enough, then the water will just uh, flow down, just pour out of this tube. So we have to find, in this problem, we have to, fi to find, determine the length of the water column remaining in the tube after we have allowed to some water to pour, to pour out. After we have allowed some water to pour out freely, we have to find the final height of this water column, which remains in the tube. We have to find the final, the original or the initial water height before we open the lower end was H plus L. But what will be the final uh, height of this water column? It's unknown. We have to find it. We have to calculate it when solving this problem. So. First of all, we have to note that atmospheric pres pressure, which is acting here on this surface, and the atmospheric pressure acting here on this surface is the same. These two, the two pressures are the same, acting from above and acting from below. So these two atmospheric pressures, as they are the same, will balance each other. And we may not consider the atmospheric influence here, the influence of an atmosphere. That is because the atmosphere is thin, it's rarefied, and the pressure difference in the atmosphere on these two levels is very small. Well, note, if this was a liquid, some liquid all around, then the pressure difference between these two levels will be high, will be quite, ris quite considerable because pressure in, in, in the liquid is given by this formula. It depends on the height, height h. That is the difference between two levels, the difference between two levels. Uh, and we find the pressure difference between these two, two levels h. That would be the case if that was a liquid all around us. The liquid has a large 
uh, density. That is why the pressure of the liquid is high, even for small values of H. But in the atmosphere, the density of atmosphere is small compared to the density of liquid, and therefore the pressure difference in these levels will be very small, and we may consider, the, therefore, the atmospheric pressure at this level and the atmospheric pressure at this level as almost the same, with high degree of accuracy. That is the same number. <coughs> I always try to, con to draw your attention to the fact that everything we do in physics is, uh, has some degree of approximation. Everything. We always neglect some minor effects. We always neglect something which can actually be neglected because it's very small compared to what we consider. We consider the, actually the weight of this water column, which is surely much larger than the, than the weight of the similar atmospheric column, uh, so that we can neglect the pressure difference of atmosphere. And we assume that atmospheric pressure here and atmospheric pressure here is practically the same. So we understand that this is not true. To be absolutely correct, we should have taken into account the pressure difference of atmosphere, but we, we don't want to do it because this is a negligible effect. This is actually negligible. So we must, uh, we must find uh, this final, final amount of water inside the tube after we have opened this lower end. Well, what can be said about it? First of all, H is certainly defined by the radius of the tube because the pressure uh, created by this water column of height H, the pressure of this water column uh, is equal to 2 sigma divided by radius of the tube, and it, this is equal to density of the tube and the acceleration of free fall on this H we know this formula, we have written it for several times, and we know that uh, the smaller the radius of the tube, the larger will be the H, li larger will be the height of the water column. The smaller the radius, the larger will be the uh, height of the water column. So H is actually defined both uh, by the surface tension and the radius of the tube. And if we are given some initial radius of the tube, it will remain unchanged during the experiment, then we know that the surface tension, which is here, the, surface, the forces of surface tension applied here, are just enough to keep uh, the height H in equilibrium. The height H will, this water of this, this amount of water of the height H will not go down if we open the lower, if we open, if we cut uh, the tube here, this water column will remain on its place due to the forces of uh, surface tension. So <coughs> this amount of water is kept in its position by surface tension at the upper surface of water. What about the lower end? The lower end of the tube, which was immersed into water and which has the length L, <coughs> when we take this water out, the lower part of the water, the lower part, will also be kept by some forces of tension here, just like in the previous problem when when water, we, when we considered the flow flowing out of water flowing out of the small uh, small holes holes in the bottom. The same here, the same here. The curved surface of water will create some forces, and the same formula will apply. The pressure difference will be 2 sigma divided by r, and so this force can keep the height h in the same way as it was before, h times liquid density and acceleration of free fall. <coughs> so this bulging surface of water will create some forces directed upward and acti acting on the water column. And this bulging surface, this 
uh, curved surface of water due to the forces of surface tension could keep some amount of water. What amount can be kept here by this small amount of, uh, by this small bulging uh, droplet of water? What height of uh, water column can be kept? Can it keep a very small amount of water? Certainly. A larger amount of water? Certainly. It can keep a larger amount of water. But can it keep infinitely large amount of water? No. That will be not enough. The forces of uh, surface tension will be not enough to keep a large amount of water. So what amount of water will be kept by these forces of tension? If uh, the pressure difference is defined by the same formula as before, then the lower part of water kept by the lower part, by the lower bulging uh, surface will be the same H, the same height H, which can be kept by the lower surface, bu curved surface. So if, if L equals H, let us do it in this way, if L equals H, then the water will not flow out. This uh, amount of water will be the same as the upper, upper part of water and the lower part, part of water will, keep, will be kept by the forces of tension here and the upper part of water will be kept by the upper uh, surface of water, curved surface of water. So if the upper side is H and lower side is also H, then the water will not flow, flow down. But if L is larger than L, then the mass of this water and the length and the weight of this water will be larger than the forces of surface tension can, can hold, and the water in this case will flow out. How much water will flow out? Well, just some amount of water will go out until the forces of surface tension will become enough to keep the remaining part of water, and the remaining part of water will have the uh, height h. So, Understanding all this physics, we may conclude that if L equals to H, then the remaining part of water here will be 2H. So that will be the amount of X. The unknown part of water will be, will be 2H. If the remaining part of water here is less than H, so if L is less than H, then nothing will flow out. The small amount of water can well be kept by this curved surface. Nothing will flow out. And the remaining part of water here, x, will be equal to h plus l, if l is smaller than h. But if l is larger than h, then what can be said about x? The upper side of water will be kept by the upper surface. So h will remain, the height h will remain anyway inside the tube. But the lower part of water will flow out if L is large enough, larger than h, then some large amount of lower part of water will flow out, and it will flow out until h, until L is equal to h. So in this case, <coughs> the remaining part will be h plus h, and it will be equal to 2h. <coughs> so if we draw a graph of x versus l, what can be said about it? If, x, if l is close to 0, it's a very small amount of water is here initially, then this lower, part, lower surface will be enough to keep this uh, to keep this water. And uh, if L is equal to zero, then nothing will flow out. This part of water can be kept by the upper surface, and the X will be equal to H. Then if we increase L, a X will also increase proportionally. And if L equals H, that is the maximum possible uh, amount of X equal to 2H. And then if we increase L, x will not change, it will remain the same, the same amount. And uh, the if L is larger than H, then this amount of water will just flow out. It will flow out until the remaining part of water here is equal to 2H. <coughs> that is, <coughs> that is the uh, so solution of this problem. And the considerations are very simple. 
the curved surface of water uh, is acting with some forces upward applied to water, and these forces are enough to keep, uh, to keep such amount of water of height h inside the tube, because here it was in balance. It was in balance with the forces of gravity and forces of surface tension. So this amount of water can be kept by uh, height h. And so the same amount can be kept in the lower part if the same curved surface is here. And it will be the same because the radius of the tube is the same. But small amounts can also be kept, uh, will not flow out. But high, larger amounts of water will flow out and until the total length of this water column is 2h. That is the main idea and the solution of this problem. So let me see if we can solve another problem. Uh, yes, we will shortly consider problem number 362. Uh, problem number 362, it says a soap bubble with a radius r, small r, is given. A soap bubble with a radius r is placed on another bubble with a radius capital R. What will be the form of the soapy film separating the two bubbles? What angles will be formed between the films at the points of contact? So we have original soap bubble of radius capital R and probably some smaller so bubble, a smaller so bubble of radius small r. And then these two small these two so bubbles are allowed to touch it each other and stick together. And finally, as this bubble uh, somehow gets in contact with the larger bubble, we will obtain something like this. A larger bubble, and here is a smaller bubble, and there is some surface in between them a surface between them. So this is a large bubble and this is a smaller bubble. And there is a surface between them, a surface which forms between them. And this surface will have a radius of curvature. Let me show it. Radius of curvature x. And we have to find this x according to the statement of the problem. We have to find this radius of curvature. And so also we have to find all these angles between the tangential lines to the surfaces because the force uh, uh, the force with which the surface acts on the border on the line of uh, on the line uh, between on the border between the two bubbles the force acting here is directed tangentially and this is force one and this is force two and this is force 3 directed along the tan tangential lines to all the three surfaces between the bubbles, between the two bubbles. The two surfaces will be uh, looking at the outside atmosphere and the inner surface will divide the two bubbles between them. <coughs> First of all, what is the surface tension? We discussed it, that this quantity can be considered as the amount of energy stored in the surface, uh, amount of energy, uh, surface energy on the unit area of the surface. And therefore, the units of measurement can be joules per meter squared. Also, we discussed it, that the same quantity can be measured in newtons per meter. And that is a force per unit length of the border of a thin film. So we have a border of thin films, and the force acting on the border 
is determined by the surface tension. And the surface tension will be the same because the material, the liquid, is the same. This is the soap bubble uh, made up of the soapy water, uh, soap solution in water, <coughs> a water solution of soap. And this is the same material, the same liquid, with the same uh, surface tension. So all the forces will be determined by the same surface tension. And the, su the force applied to unit length of the border between the soaps, this the force uh, applied to a unit length will be the same acting here and here and here. All the forces will be the same. And this point of the border must be in equilibrium. It must be in static equilibrium. Therefore, the vector sum of all these three forces must be zero. And as forces have the same magnitude, the vector sum of these three forces of the same magnitude will be zero only if the angles between, between the forces will be 2 pi divided by 3. 2 pi divided by 3. And the same angle is here. And the same angle is here. And 2 pi divided by 3 is 120 degrees. <coughs> because 2 pi is 360 degrees, so this angle will be 120. Also, what can be said about uh, the radius of curvature of the inner surface between the uh, bubbles. <coughs> well, uh, if we take into account the uh, atmospheric pressure outside and the inner pressure inside, then uh, the inner pressure inside the first bubble and the Atmospheric pressure will act on every everything, both the up uh, the large bubble and the small bubble. So the atmospheric pressure uh, is not important here. The, what what is important it is only the pressure created by the surface, uh, by the curved surface. And so the pressure inside the the large bubble will be four sigma times large R capital R, four sigma because there are two surfaces of this bubble. Instead of two sigma, we, we take four. We take the double, the double uh, pressure created by two surfaces, both the out, outer surface and inner surface, and uh, the pressure inside the small bubble will be four sigma divided by small r, and the pressure difference between the two bubbles, that is, the pressure difference between the two bubbles, that is one. Uh, quantity one pressure in the small bubble min minus one, one minus the pressure di in the second larger bubble will be the pressure difference will 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 define the curvature radius of curvature of the of the surface between the bubbles so that will be and the material is the same and the surface tension will be the same sigma and that will be the surface tension between uh, that will be the difference of pressures between the two bubbles here. That is the pressure inside the first small bubble, the pressure inside the large bubble, and the difference of pressures will define the radius of curvature x between the two bubbles. That's a simple uh, equation of static equilibrium. That is the equation of static equilibrium, which defines uh, the equilibrium of this surface between the bubbles. The pressure in the small bubble minus the, which is larger because the radius is smaller, minus the pressure inside the large bubble, and this pressure difference between the two bubbles will define the radius of curvature of the surface between the bubbles. So in this equation, we we can cancel for four sigma, and we will obtain one over small r minus one over capital R equal one over x. That is a very simple equation to define x. I will not uh, waste my time on solving such simple things. You can uh, finish the solution by yourself. So everything is given here. Small r is given, capital R is given in the problem. We need to find unknown quantity x. It's very simple. So physics is clear in this problem. Well, on this point, <coughs> let us finish this lecture. Thank you and goodbye.